There's a lot of confusion about who the sons of God are in Genesis 6, and many people end up looking to extra-biblical texts for answers, but I believe the answers are all found in the Bible, and we don't need to look anywhere else. Hi, my name is Lex, and welcome to Unlearn. Genesis chapter 6 has an interesting statement about the sons of God taking wives from the daughters of men. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, all of whom they chose. There are basically three theories about who the sons of God are. The first theory is that the sons of God refers to the sons of Seth, which are human descendants of Adam through Seth. And they say the daughters of men are the daughters of the pagan nations. This theory was held by people such as Origen and Augustine of Hippo. The second theory is that the sons of God are angels. This theory appears in earlier records found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was also mentioned by the Jewish historian Josephus. A third theory is that the sons of God are the defiled kings of various Canaanite cities. This theory is held by a variety of people in the scholarly community. However, I want to set aside all of these theories and just look at what the Bible says about who the sons of God are. This phrase only appears five times in the Old Testament, twice in Genesis 6 and three times in the book of Job. We already looked at the first appearance of this phrase, so let's examine the second. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Here we see that the children of this union are referred to as giants and called men of renown. This actually sounds similar to some of the pagan stories about the demigods, the offspring of gods mating with humans. Is it possible that the pagan stories came from the same events described here in Genesis? Possibly. But let's continue our search. The book of Job mentions the sons of God three times, and the context in Job is very interesting. The first two mentions are about a heavenly council meeting with God, and Satan came as well. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. In these two council meetings, we see that God and his heavenly court are assembled to discuss matters that concern humanity. It doesn't make sense to think that these sons of God are human kings, nor does it make sense to say they are sons of Seth. However, it does make sense to think they might be angels or some sort of heavenly beings. We see the heavenly council referred to in the Psalms as well. Psalm 82 speaks about God standing among other gods and judging them. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. In Hebrew, it says the congregation of the El, which can be translated as divine or God. And it's a word that's often used to speak about other gods, the gods of the pagans. So who are these other gods that Yahweh judges? Consider what Psalm 89 says about the sons of the mighty. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? In Hebrew, it says sons of the Elim, and the word Elim means gods. In other words, who among the sons of the gods can be likened to Yahweh? Now back to Job. The third reference in the book of Job is even more significant than the first two, because God is questioning Job and asks him, where were you when the earth was formed and the sons of God shouted for joy as the stars sang? Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and he said, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. This verse indicates that the sons of God were present with God when he formed the earth and they were rejoicing in heaven. So clearly we can't say this is referring to pagan kings or the children of Seth since Seth wasn't even born yet and humans weren't even in existence yet when God laid the foundations of the earth. So once again, this points to the sons of God as some sort of heavenly being and both Peter and Jude seem to have the same understanding. Peter speaks about the angels who sinned in the time of Noah. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Where in the story of Noah do we see angels sinning? The only place that makes sense is Genesis 6, when the sons of God mate with human wives. To this point, some have argued that according to Yeshua, angels don't take wives. We see this mentioned in Matthew 22. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. 
So according to this verse, angels are not supposed to marry. Now let's look at the parallel passage in Luke 20. Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given a marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given a marriage, nor can they die any more, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Yeshua said those who are worthy of the resurrection are equal to the angels and are called sons of God. This is an interesting connection and goes along with the idea that the sons of God in Genesis 6 are angels. But what about Yeshua saying that angels don't marry? The angels are not supposed to marry. That's the problem in Genesis 6. And that's why Peter says the angels sinned. And the book of Jude says the angels did not remain in their proper abode and are punished and bound in chains until the judgment. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under the darkness for the judgment of the great day. So according to the biblical evidence, what we see in Genesis 6 is forbidden marriage between angels and humans, angels leaving their proper place and seeking human wives. Now we need to look at what it means for Yeshua to be the only begotten Son of God. John begins his gospel by talking about the Word of God who created all things and took on flesh and dwelt among us. John also calls him the only begotten Son of God. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Yeshua also refers to Himself as the only begotten Son of God in chapter 3. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this phrase is used again in reference to Yeshua in 1 John chapter 4. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. If angels are sometimes referred to as sons of God, why is Yeshua called the only begotten Son of God? This phrase distinguishes him from the angels. He's the only Son of God who came forth from the Father's own substance. The angels were created beings and were called sons of God. The Israelites were also called children of God. But Yeshua has a unique title as the only begotten Son of God. He didn't become a son. He was always God's Son. He existed eternally as the Son of God. However, the Bible says that we can become sons of God too. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Notice that they shall be called sons of God. They're not currently called sons of God. We see this phrase used again in a future tense concerning the resurrection. Nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. This is speaking about those who are part of the resurrection, who have received their new heavenly body, they will be called sons of God. Also, in Romans, we see that the creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The Bible explains that we become sons of God by adoption. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We can call God our Heavenly Father because we have received the spirit of adoption. This happens when we're saved. We receive the Holy Spirit and we are able to call upon God as our Father. So Genesis 6 speaks about angels sinning by taking human wives and calls them sons of God. Job speaks about a heavenly council and calls the angels sons of God. Psalm speaks about God judging the pagan gods and their sons. And those who believe in Yeshua and are counted worthy to be part of the resurrection will be equal with the angels and will be called sons of God. However, Yeshua stands apart from all others as the only begotten Son of God. He's unique among all the sons of God. There is none like Him. Hey, if this video was helpful, then share it with your friends and family. If you're new to this channel, welcome. And I want to invite you to check out some of my other videos. Maybe this one. I also want to say thank you to the people who financially support this ministry. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much. And remember, the truth will set you free. We'll see you next time.